It had been over five years since my wife of fifteen years, the once Adelia Lynn Masters, a local branch manager for Bank America, had asked me for a divorce. Her simple explanation was, I am no longer in love with you. She claimed there was no one else. Adelia said over time we had just drifted apart. I had my doubts, but was never, ever able to prove anything. I had heard her on her cell phone, talking on the phone shortly after that night, whispering about the big changes coming into her life. We had agreed to joint custody of our daughters, who were at that time, fourteen and twelve, during private interviews with professionals. Both the girls had decided to live with her. The reason I was recalling it all was because of what Us Today, a newspaper I subscribed to, had in it this Thursday morning. It was an article about the regional junior vice president, Adelia Lynn Peterson, and her husband, a senior vice president, Ronald Peterson, attending a New York charity function. Another photo showed that their daughters, aged 19 and 17, named Amanda and Miranda Peterson, dressed to the nines, described as up-and-comers, also being in attendance. It was definitely Adelia. She now had the status and prestige she had always wanted. The article had said she was highly coveted in social networks. Her current husband had at one time had been a person I called a casual friend. We had all met shortly after Adelia had started working together with him at the local branch of the Bank of America. Their daughters were mine, but now were going through life with different last names. My first thought was to call my trusted assistant, Helen Beard, into my office, to ask her to verify that my eyes were seeing what I saw. If my vision was correct, it would explain why everybody's search for them had been for naught. Helen was also a distant cousin to my wife, but was off for the day for personal reasons. On the day our divorce was to be granted, my wife Adelia was a no-show. I asked my lawyer to find out why before going ahead without her. The judge had ordered us both to be in attendance so we could testify before him that what was being presented to the court by our lawyers had been approved by both of us. Her lawyer had to admit she had been transferred out of the state. My lawyer asked me if I had given permission to my wife for the children to be moved out of state. I said no. That was when my nightmare really began. Judge Donald MacDonald's whole attitude changed in a second. When the judge learned that fact, he asked if I could go outside and try to call them with my cell phone. I left the courtroom and tried. I learned the numbers I had for all three of them was no longer in service. I checked their Facebook pages with my cell phone and found that I had been unfriended and blocked. I returned to the court and told my lawyer all that I had learned. He passed it on the judge. The judge issued a warrant for arrest instantly against my wife, charging her with parental kidnapping. He halted the divorce proceeding until she herself appeared in person before him in his court. Her lawyer was furious and tried to appeal to the common decency of the judge, in an attempt to get him to reconsider. Her lawyer implied it was not really a big deal. After all, Mr. Masters can verify as to what they agreed to. The judge said yes, he did. He just testified that he did not agree to the kids leaving the state. The lawyer responded by saying that may not be true. He could be lying. You're right. That's why she should be here. He clarified his order by adding with both their daughters. The police later informed me during their investigation that her side of the family had claimed she had requested a transfer because I had been sexually abusing my daughters for years. Staff at the local Bank of America seemed eager to confirm those same claims. When the police officers asked for proof, nobody had any. It was just what Adelia had repeatedly said. They had just accepted it as the truth because they knew Adelia quite well. Why does it make a difference in nothing but just a man, was their answer when they interviewed the ladies of our extended family privately. Even social services who had interviewed the children said that they had no clue about this new allegation, as it was never brought up by either of the girls in their interviews of them. They had not picked up anything that would have tipped them off. Yet the rumor spread by word of mouth throughout our town, thanks to members of Adelia's extended family. Over the last five years, the judge and I had stayed connected. As a result, we had developed a friendship because we both loved to fly fish. It did not surprise him to see me drop over that night, to see him and his wife after dinner. There's a reason I brought the paper with me. There's something you have to see. I said seriously. I then opened the paper to the article and let him see it for himself. 
Son of a witch, the judge said. Ruth, can you hear me? My cell phone. John, I need you to give me a few minutes, please. Donald. The picture beneath is of my two daughters. The judge's face went white. Jesus Christ, for all this time, they have been hiding in plain sight. I went outside and sat at their patio. Ruth joined me, carrying us both a beer. He's livid. I have never seen him so mad. He's on the phone with the FBI. What did you show him? Ruth said. A picture from today's paper of my missing wife and her new husband. It's the first hint we had in five years that she's is still alive. I replied, the second picture on the page was my daughter's with new last names. Oh crap, what a mess. That's why he's called the FBI. Because interstate flight with a kidnapping charge is a federal offense. Ruth said, why didn't the Bank of America help you find her? They got a legal ruling from a federal judge, appeals court, and fighting the court order issued by your husband saying that because it was a family matter, they did not have to comply. I stated, tell the judge I've gone home because my emotions are getting to me. I said, tell him he can call me at my office in the morning. For me, it was a long, rough night. Was there more to their relationship back than just friendship? We were already married when she got hired as a financial loans officer in the department he ran. I was just getting my consulting firm off the ground. The question, because of my daughter's name changes, were they actually his or mine? Did either he or I know what the real truth was? I said to myself, slow down, because Amanda had already been born when Adelia joined the bank. The next morning, my concerns turned towards Helen. How was she going to handle it all over these last five years? Her hate for her cousin had grown. I knew she believed me. Her actions over the years had proved that to the extreme. Many a time, I wanted to take her into my arms and open up and tell her my feelings, but I didn't. She deserved the best a man could give her with me, and with what I was facing, that was impossible. Helen, in my eyes, was a beautiful woman. Her auburn hair, her soft smile and warm heart, were treasuring values a good man deserved to have. I could and did daydream about her, but that is as far as I would go. No man had a right to ask any woman to share the nightmare I was in. It was a busy day at work the next day, and I was thankful because it kept my mind from other things. It was towards the end of the day when my personal assistant knocked and opened the door. John, there's two gentlemen here to see you from the FBI. Shall I let them in? Helen asked. By all means. I've been expecting them, I responded as I stood up. How can I help you? I said as they walked in. First of all, I'm Mac Holmes, and this Douglas Drysdale. Mac said, We are here to get some background about this whole situation. I told them how we had met her current husband years ago. I explained that as far as I knew, there was no affair at that time, but because of their relationship as it now stood, and with my daughter's name changes, it raised a lot of questions. I think the only way we could verify what was the truth is by forcing DNA tests to be done on all five of us. I thought that Amanda, my oldest, had been born before she was hired by the Bank of America. But now, I had to wonder if my wife Adelia knew him from before that time period. I said it was Judge Donald MacDonald that had stopped the divorce proceeding after he laid the charges of paternal kidnapping, because she, by not showing up, had ignored his court order. What you're going to need to find out is, did she file for divorce in New York? And is she legally married to him? So you're telling me that the judge never granted the divorce? Douglas said. That's right. The court records will show that the divorce was not be granted because of her failure to obey his court order to show up in court, to verify to him that what was agreed upon was actually being presented to the court. I said, Judge Donald is a man who can't be swayed or influenced by the stupidity of others. He does that in all of his cases because at one time he had been duped by a crooked lawyer. Did you give your wife permission to leave the state with your children? asked Mac. No. We learned from her lawyer that day that she had moved out of state. The judge asked me to try to contact them on my cell phone. When I came back, I told him that their cell phone numbers had been disconnected and that I had been unfriended and blocked from their Facebook pages. So she had moved out of state before the divorce was even final and got married less than a week later. Doug let out. 
That makes clear that everything she did was done deliberately. It was not an accident, Max said. That contradicts what we were told. She stated in her interview in New York this morning. When was the last time you had any contact with your wife? Douglas asked. That would be two weekends before our final court hearing, when Adelia and our daughters removed the last things they wanted out of our house. Child services had talked to them both, and our children had decided that for now, it was best that they should live with their mom, I explained. Since then, I have not received any legal notice or public notice in our local newspaper. I think we can assume I have not been divorced. That means that his signature had to be forged in their adoption papers, Max said. We can charge them both with trying to cover up a federal crime. I asked what adoption papers, but I got no answer. Mr. Master, could you provide us with your signature? Helen typed up me a letter on our letterhead that says, as per Mr. Mac Holmes and Douglas Drysdale of the FBI request, this letter is to verify my compliance with their request for a copy of my signature. I will need you to witness it, then photocopy it for our records before providing them the original. I said, knowing she was listening to every word. Do you still live at 87654 Yale Road East? Mac asked. No. I finally had to get a court order allowing me to sell it. I said the police were getting tired of the rumors that a sexual predator was loose in the neighborhood. They helped me get the court order from Judge McDonald to sell it. Just after I was attacked and hospitalized for the second time, he had frozen all our assets the day she had not shown up in court. I now live outside of town in a house I had built out at Ryder Lake. It is a very private setting with five acres of land. I had wired with electricity for my own protection because there are still many that believe the lies spread by others. After they had left, I let Helen know what was going on. She was shocked to learn that her older, distant cousin had been found. I saw the hope growing in her eyes along with all the questions. There was still too much not known. As a result, I still had no answers. Helen, when I leave tonight, my cell phone will be shut off. If you are bothered because of my situation, use your best judgment. In an emergency, call me on my house phone, I said. Helen hated her cousin Adelia for destroying a good man's reputation and his personal relationships. John had lost a lot of family and friends because of the rumors she created. She would not have believed that kind of damage could be done by someone if she had not seen it herself. She had often wondered how much did one have to endure before the truth won out. It was hard for her to sit and wait for it to work out. Human nature, because of what she had witnessed, had proven beyond a doubt that the lie was always accepted. Most believed that if it wasn't for his company, John would have mostly ended it a long time ago. He had sunk all his free time in his work, and as a result, he had tripled his client base by three times or more. Finally, he had started coming out of his protective shell two years ago. That was when her fresh supply of freshly caught trout seemed to die off. What surprised her the most was to this date. She had not heard his wife or his children's name once from his lips since the day they left town until today. During that time period, she had hopelessly watched him waste away. He was now a shadow of his former self. Helen had been 14 years old when she met John Masters, age 19, for the first time at a family's pre-Christmas party. Adelia had just announced their engagement, making her the center of attention. She had known instantly that their relationship would not last. He was a financial planner who was good at raising the money. She was a social climber who needed the attention, prestige, and the glory. He would always put what was best for the family first. She would always have to be first. And as long as she felt she was getting that, their relationship would last. She had told Adelia's mother if they had kids, they would divorce as soon as they reached their teens. She had nailed it right. Her own marriage did not last because her husband had died while serving before she had the chance to become a mother. As a result, when she needed advice, she had turned to John. It was John who helped her through those rough times. He stood beside her as she buried her husband and carried her as she mourned. He had become not only her boss, but her best friend. She had watched him go through his own living heck these last five years, and it helped her realize that he was the one she wanted to grow old with. John's biggest problem was no matter what he did, he was haunted daily because of the past. 
As a result, he was stuck in a reality that few could see, one that was controlled by the actions of others. The way Adelia and her children disappeared had caused the rumors to spread like a wildfire. Many now believe that John had killed them to protect his own image. It was believed the reason he had so much security was that their bodies were buried on his property. For the first time in a long time, I stopped Ruby Tuesdays for supper. I got the unlimited salad bar with a side order of catfish. I had just got back to my seat from my first trip to the salad bar when Adelia's father showed up without asking me. He pulled out a chair, and he sat his big bum down. I heard from Adelia this morning, Roger said. I said nothing, but just kept on eating. I had nothing to say to this a-hole. The last time he had spoken to me in public, he had threatened to find a way to kill me for sexually abusing his lovely two granddaughters. It was public scenes like that that had magnified my situation, causing the rumors to flow. Amanda and Miranda are doing well, Roger Carmichael said softly. My daughter wants me to find a way to help her find a way to resolve these unsettled issues from the past. Adelia has finally admitted to me that you never touched your children in the way she accused you of. She used that false claim as an excuse to explain her need to disappear from town the way she did. I want to find a way to apologize to you. I also know she has talked to quite a few of the relatives today. Spread the word to everyone she talked to that I will believe that they are sincere when they have got a signed statement written out and verified by a notary. As to what she said and why, I said, when they have done that and have come to my office to give it to me, I will believe them. Until then, even this conversation is BS. Until that's done, you're all dead in my eyes. Darn, that's harsh, John, Roger said, but I understand where you're coming from and why. Do you really? I'm just treating you the way you have treated me for the last five years. Dwell on that fact for a while now. Leave me alone and let me eat in peace, I said coldly. Remember too many in this town, thanks to the extended families, rumors caused by their versions of the truth believe that I should be dead because of something I have never done. I watched Roger walk away. Did he really believe that a two-minute chat would solve his daughter's problems? Had he figured he could sit down and with a two-minute of conversation wipe five years of hate, hurt, and pain away? They had promoted. Did they all think that it would be that easy? Was I that stupid in their eyes that they would try to act? That nothing happened? A few minutes later, the waitress who had served me came over and sat down. Mr. Masters, I went to school with your daughters. Based on what I just overheard, I have to say that neither one of them knew what was going on that Friday before they disappeared. We were looking forward to seeing each other the following Monday at school. I witnessed the man who just left working with others of your wife's family while they packed up their things after they left. The waitress said after hearing what I just did, I thought you should know. Thank you for honesty. It's refreshing to hear. I did not even know that, I replied. I'm not surprised that I have been lied to about what really was going on for all these years. I usually keep to myself because I got tired of hearing the whispers and the lies they felt they had to spread about me. With that said, she went back to work when I used my card to pay the ticket. I doubled the total, giving her what perhaps would be her best tip of the night. I had a great weekend fishing in my canoe on the lake. Each day, I kept my limit, but threw the rest back. One of my favorite meals these days is fresh rainbow trout cooked with flour and butter. Both nights, I ate two of them with eggs and toast. Early Monday morning, I was at work working on the first pot of coffee for the day that I had made reading USA Today. I was a bit disappointed that nothing was being reported, but realized that I was hoping for too much, too fast. Helen showed up half an hour early. For that to happen, the earth had to have moved in a new direction. She was excited about something because she was in an extremely bubbly mood. After pouring a coffee for herself, she joined me. Looking back, Adelia and I had got married right after she graduated from grade 12. Amanda had come just over a year later. I spent those first few years flipping houses by cheap selling high after remodeling. She took courses, starting out as a teller at a bank. I worked at learning the financial business from scratch. One of the former owners saw my natural ability and became my mentor. When the partners decided to retire, Masters Consulting was born. They worked part-time for me and helped it grow in leaps and bounds. 
When Miranda came into the world, I had my whole future planned. I heard what you told Roger Friday. Helen said, heck, everybody did. My cell phone was ringing all weekend. I told them all. Do you blame him? After what the family has done to him? You all made him a walking dead man in this town. I got one question, boss. Why are you requesting notarized statements? I smiled and said public slander. Oh, crap, Helen said. You're going to sue for everything she has, wouldn't you? I asked. Yes, because that's the only way you can clear your name and restore your credibility. Even better, by getting a court order freezing their funds until my slander suite is done. Restricts them. It forces them to have to rely on the public defender. I said, would you like to go into federal court using a freebie lawyer? Well, boss, it's going to be an interesting week. If all those who called me follow through, we're going to end up with about 20. Helen said most of the family are basically good, honest people. The problem is, I pointed out all weekend they had accepted the lies as the truth. I told them when they went to church on Sunday to ponder over that. The question is, will their own guilt move them to do what they know is right? As she headed to her desk, she turned and said with an inviting smile, Boss, remember some of us single girls do enjoy spending an early morning fishing for the first time in years. I broke out in a laugh when I left for the day. I said to Helen, thanks for putting a smile on my face. Helen was and always would be my rock. I firmly believed if it was not for her, I would not have made through the nightmare of these last five years. By lunchtime on Thursday, we had 24 signed and notarized statement, all basically saying the same things. My wife in name only had told them all that she had to leave town because I had been sexually abusing my daughters for years, and that she had finally found the strength to get out. Adelia had claimed she filed for divorce on those grounds. If any of them had checked the court documents, they would prove for themselves what she had said was false. Some had helped her sneak out of town with her two daughters and had promised to Delia. Their silence all admitted to her, calling them this last week in an attempt to resolve the past issues. In doing so, had admitted that everything she said about me was a lie. It was my view that Adelia was afraid of losing the new life she had built for herself. She had no remorse or guilt to what she had done. She would have gone on as if nothing had happened if I had not caught her image in the paper. I knew since my daughters had not attempted to contact me that they believed whatever she had told them. The best I could hope for, with the facts now coming out, was the satisfaction of knowing I might get the feeling that justice for me was won. I had reached the conclusion that, as far as my daughters were concerned, like most of the family, I had been written out of their lives, having a name to go on. Helen was able to find her current legal address where they both worked and the address of that location, along with their current net worth. She said your appointment with the civil lawyer is that to make it clear that Adelia needs to be served before she is charged. Also remember to tell her that you would like a court order to freeze their assets. Darn, I thought to myself. Helen, you're leaving nothing to chance. God have mercy on Adelia, if you ever see her in person, because you won't. I came back to the office at 430, carrying a chilled bottle of champagne and two long-stemmed glasses. The lawyer Helen had picked out was taking the case. I gave her everything. The old court records, the stenographer's recording, the judge ruling, the affidavits all signed along with a copy of the warrant for her arrest. I also brought her the copy I had showing the news article promoting my wife's new life. I made sure she knew everything about the relationship of all three of us. And when I had officially met him, when the lawyer learned of the compliance of the Bank of America, she said we should sue them too, for deliberately contributing to the deliberate attempt to destroy a man's life. I said as long as one suite covers the other, I'm game. She smiled and said, Okay, it's on. I smiled in the knowledge that we Americans in general will sue over anything. Helen and I shared the bottle of medium champagne I brought back with me. The 750 milliliters bottle gave us about two glasses each. We were just sitting and chatting when our phone rang. Helen answered it and mouthed, It's the judge. I turned on the speaker. Hi, Donald. How's it going today? I said. All things considered, quite good. John, 
I called to let you know that the FBI is moving ahead for a grand jury against Adelia Lynn Peterson and Ronald Emerson Peterson next Wednesday. They will also be asking for an order to allow them to bring Miranda Peterson into protective custody, along with an order forcing all to submit to a blood test for DNA. Judge Donald said, Your older daughter is now of legal age, and she's beyond their hands. Thanks for the info. It is appreciated. I said, Now about my divorce. I will grant it with favorable terms the moment I have her in my court, even if I have to accomplish it by video link. Donald replied, I'm going to hold her accountable for her conduct before me in a very serious matter. Helen said, after he had hung up, The judge is going to come down heavy on her, but can he put her in jail? I think the kidnapping charges and any charges related to that will be under the FBI's discretion. But he can rule on the contempt of court charge for failure to appear. I said, I really have no clue what the law allows him to do about that. I guess it's wait and see for you again, Helen said with sadness. Yes, I have been waiting for over five years. A few more weeks isn't going to make much difference. It also gives the attorney I hired a few more days to deal with the court and have her served. If anyone knew anything, they were not saying anything. The next week went by very quickly. On Thursday morning, my lawyer called to inform me that the papers had been served on them while they were at work on Wednesday. She mentioned she had successfully had anything in her names, like their bank accounts, and assets frozen. That afternoon, Doug Drysdale, the FBI agent, called me and asked me to stop by St. Francis Hospital to have blood drawn for a DNA test before six. The sample would be sent to them for testing. I gladly did it. I was out on the lake fishing for breakfast Saturday morning when my cell phone rang. I looked at the caller. It was Helen. You got to go to the office and see the U.S. Today newspaper, she said. It shows Adelia, Ronald, and Miranda being detained by the FBI last night during another social event. I replied, I'm on the lake heading for shore. Once I get changed, I will head into the office and check it out. Curiosity was killing the cat. I had to know what the FBI was going to charge them with. It took me about an hour to get to my office. Helen had been right. But what really got my attention was what the reporter wrote. Kidnapping. We all have a view of what it is. Does it really mean our thoughts are correct under federal law? Kidnapping is defined as using force, lies, or fear to steal or hold an individual captive, either by force or by sociological means, in order to benefit from it in some manner. Kidnapping is a felony. The average sentencing is 12 years. This is just one of the charges facing Adelia and Ronald Peterson because of their conduct after she left Missouri with her children without clearing it with her husband, who she was divorcing at that time. According to what court records show when she filed was because she no longer loved him. The judge issued the bench warrant against her for kidnapping after halting the divorce proceedings because of her failure to appear as ordered. It was our own story about the couple three weeks ago that finally led to her being caught. It is apparent that Adelia used the master's name when she got married to Ronald Peterson in a civil ceremony in New York City, just a week after she left Missouri. We have learned that the paperwork filed to have Ronald Peterson legally adopt Amanda and Miranda Masters were fraudulently created and submitted to the court who had approved it. Mr. John Masters' signature had been forged. The FBI now believed this was done by the couple so that they could hide the master's daughters in plain sight. It seems the couple had worked together in the Bank of America years earlier, when they were starting out their prospective careers. Mr. John Masters had tried to get the Bank of America to disclose his wife's whereabouts, but they got a court order in a appeals court that allowed them not to. It now painfully appears that Ronald Peterson, as a senior vice president of the Bank of America, was using his authority and power to thwart his wife's first husband's attempts to locate his still legal wife and his children. We have learned that Mr. John Masters has filed a civil suit for public slander against Adelia Peterson, because she had told over 20 of her family and friends that she had left her first husband because she caught him sexually abusing his daughters. According to local police, they are five years later still getting reports accusing him of being a pedophile. They say this is not true, and that Mr. Masters has been forced by the views of society to become a recluse. I asked, was it really that bad for John Masters? 
The police officer responded, We still have two open attempted murder cases open because he was the victim. Many believed here that he had killed the three of them and got away with it. He has also filed suit against Bank of America and its senior vice president, Ronald Peterson, for martial interference. Let's look at it from the victim's side for a moment. Don't you think he deserves justice? I do, but what will he get? Nothing, because our society doesn't take that into consideration when dealing with criminals. They can voice their opinion, but that does not get printed in the media because that don't sell newspapers. Quite often the victim pays the price, for years. The criminal ends up with free room and board. The article was stunning. It had laid out all the facts. I had just refilled my coffee cup when the phone rang. I answered it saying, This is Masters Consulting. How may I help you? Turns out it was the Southeast Missouri, a newspaper. I confirmed that what had been written about the whole situation was actually factual. The reporter asked, out of curiosity, how these last five years had been for me. I told him of the two still open cases of attacks on me by unknown sources. The police were treating both cases as attempted murder. I explained how far the rumors had gone. Then I asked him, how do you view what I went through? He said I would call it a living heck. It was hard for me to believe the nightmare was ending. My name to a degree was being cleared. I knew that five years had destroyed for good any relationship I had with my daughters, just like the rumors had done with my own parents and siblings. When this was over, I decided I would sell the business and leave the area for good, if the one person I trusted was willing to come with me. Before I left the office, I cut out the article and photographs. Then I scanned them and had hard copies printed. I put them in a legal envelope for the civil lawyer to be used in my case. Amanda Peterson had been stunned when the FBI took her mother and stepfather into custody after arresting them. Then, they had let her younger sister away to another vehicle. She was grateful that one of the agents took her aside and told her as much as she could. Her real parents were not divorced. He had never agreed to her name change or his giving up of custody as her sister, and she had been led to believe. The FBI explained that anything that had his signatures on it was proved not to be his, but just a poor attempt, a forgery. Her mother was charged with two accounts of parental kidnapping. Her stepfather was charged with kidnapping, aiding and abetting the ongoing covering up of a felony. They were both charged with numerous other charges. Miranda would be held in protective custody until DNA proved who her father was, since her own mother was still claiming that her current husband was. Amanda had gone home to pack her clothes. She was now sitting waiting area in the St. Louis airport to catch a connector flight to Cape. That was when she noticed the headline on the U.S. Today, left on the empty seat. Picking it up, she read the whole article. By the time she was done, she was crying for the hour flight into Cape. Amanda kept trying to figure out why her mother had done what she had done to her father. Nothing to her made sense. Sure, her mother had confided in her about Ronald and their online relationship, but had never expected it to go anywhere until her mother asked her father for a divorce. She had been sitting on the steps leading up to their bedrooms in their old home while they were talking after dinner over coffees. When she heard her mother tell him that she no longer loved him and wanted a divorce, her father had been devastated at the time. Her mother's view was, who the heck cares? He's nothing but a man, and there are plenty other suckers like him now. With what the newspaper had disclosed about her mother's and Ronald's previous relationship. It had raised even more questions as she watched the plane start its descent. She wondered if the empty car rental booth at the airport still had a phone. It was 11 o'clock in the morning. Amanda Peterson was parked outside their old home waiting for the sheriff department's vehicle to leave. She had been there for over two hours when suddenly she was blocked in by two unmarked cars. An officer with a gun pulled identified himself and asked her to leave her vehicle with her hands up in the air. She complied. Who are you? Why are you watching this place? The taller officer asked. My name is Amanda Peterson, and I was waiting for the sheriff's department to leave so I could talk to my father and your father's name. The officer asked John Masters. Amanda replied. Oh, crap, the officer said in total shock. Tom, go tell Joanne and Jody to put the coffee on. It's not what we thought. The five of us are going to have to have a very long talk. Miss Peterson, I'm Detective Joel Smithers. 
I know your father well. What brought you back here after all this time? In part. What happened last night in the article in the U.S. Today newspaper? I have a copy in the car. Should I get it? Please do. It will help to let me know what you know, Joel said after the introduction was made and the coffee. Poor Detective Joel Smithers read the whole article out loud. Everyone seemed stunned, except him. You believe my father, didn't you? Detective Amanda said I was one of the few. But yes. From the time the rumors started being spread by your mother's extended family about your father, it was already too late. He was stopped. This house was vandalized so much that he had no choice but to sell. I think it was the second time he got hospitalized, because he got jumped on from behind. That almost finished him off for good was what made him move. We were lucky we got to him before he bled out down here. The folks wanted to do to him what they believed he had done to all of you. Most believed you were all were dead and that he had done it. Your father, in a lot of people's eyes, has been a walking dead man. Jody bought this place fairly cheap, but it took till he started bringing the sheriff's car home for things to settle down. You're telling me that it got so bad for my dad that it drove him out? Amanda said. Where does he live now? Yes. A lot of us in the South still have our own views on what justice is. Your dad has got five acres over at Ryder Lake, but it's completely fenced in with electric wire and gated with an electronic lock. In the two years he's lived there, outside of his work, no one has seen him in town. How am I going to get a hold of him? Amanda wondered aloud. I think I know how, Tom said. I'll have dispatch see if his business has an emergency contact. Be right back. A few minutes later, Tom was back with an address written on a piece of paper. Miss Peterson, do you know a Helen Beard? asked Tom. She is a second cousin of my mother's, I believe. Why? Amanda asked. According to our emergency records, she is the only one who can get a hold of him. 24 over 7, Tom said. I talked to her, and she has agreed to talk to you without making any promises. An official fact about Miss Beard that I just heard concerning her. She's tough, hard, and cold when anyone comes towards her boss because of a personal nature. I think you should know. Helen protects your father, John, like a mother hawk does her newborn. If she does not believe you, she will do anything she can to ensure you will never get near him. She's on the way to your father's business right now. She said she will wait for you there. He handed her the address. Amanda thanked them for their help before she headed off. What kind of woman could hate a man so much to do what Adelia did to John? Jody asked one that blames him for all the things she believed was wrong in her life. Answered Joanne as soon as the car pulled up beside hers, Helen Beard turned on her audio voice record app on her cell phone and opened the door to allow Amanda to enter the building. The first question I want to be answered, Amanda, is what was going on around the time of the three of your disappearance, and what did you know and learn later? Helen asked. Miranda and I got woke up by our mother that Saturday morning at 4 a.m., dragged out of bed, still half asleep. We were told to get dressed to go. We got out to find the car packed with some of our clothing. She told us she was off for a week and we were going on a surprise trip to New York. Amanda said that was the first we heard about it. So you had no idea what was really going on according to you. Helen said, according to what some of the family are saying now, they knew of Ronald and your mother's online relationship, but they felt it was just a friendship. Look, I caught my mom chatting with Ronald, but I had no clue that they had worked together when we were younger. She told me she had met him at a regional conference, and they had become friends. Amanda replied, we were half an hour down the road when I realized we didn't have our phones. That's when I confronted my mother. Her response was that she had been granted sole custody of us by the courts, and we were moving to New York because she had been promoted and transferred on short notice. I now know that was part of a lie, but I had no reason not to believe her. Helen Beard knew that part of that was true, based on what was now being told by others who had opened up to finally admitting that Adelia's children had not known her plans. I also asked about our laptops. My mother said the phones were cancelled because of the move, and she had to pay the balance in full. As for the laptops, the movers were to pack them and ship them when they moved the furniture. We did not know that they were never going to show up. Amanda said we did 20-plus hours driving in two days. 
So what happened when you got to the outskirts of New York? Mom told Miranda to open her purse and take out her new phone. It had a New York phone number. Until then, we didn't even know she had it. Then, she had my sister open Google Maps. It gave us a bunch of directions. What we did not know was that we were being directed to Ronald Peterson's home. We found that out about two hours later. He had maneuvered her huge promotion and set it up so that they could be together. The family back here were instructed to dispose of everything but the family pictures, which were mailed to us later. As we were unpacking the car, my sister and I found the filled-out adoption papers. Amanda explained it was Ronald that explained that our parents and he had agreed to it, because our mother and he were getting married. Amanda explained, Mother was the one that disclosed to us later that night that we had to give Ronald and her a chance because he was our biological father. Gradually, we were led to believe that when Dad found out about Ronald's true relationship with us, he decided that he had no choice but to write us out of his lives. Amanda, I believe you because I already have heard about 50% about what you told me from the family for the last few days. The only thing we knew for sure was that the school district had given a deal to printed out copies of your school records so you can register at your new school when you found a place to live. Now that Adelina has been found, the truth is coming out. Just so you know, I have recorded our conversation as soon as I have forwarded it to the FBI and your father, we will go for an early supper at Ruby Tuesdays. Helen said, While I am doing that, look at these copies of statements made with a notary. Ponder over this, though. If she lied to you about your father, John Masters, could she be lying about Ronald Peterson, too? Helen went into the other room and watched Amanda for a few minutes before forwarding their conversation. Amanda was learning just how much her mother's family had conspired with their mother against John. She had sent the conversation to John first, his civil lawyer. Second, because Amanda's honest statement was so damaging. Then, she had sent it to the FBI. During the whole time she was watching Amanda. Amanda made no attempt to contact anyone. Just before she was about to go back, John texted her, I will be there waiting for your arrival. Thank you. She texted back, I have left her alone for about half an hour to allow her to read some of the statements we have gotten from the family. She has not tried to contact anyone. With that done, she rejoined Amanda. Helen, do you have any idea why my mother told the family? My father had been sexually abusing us for years, Amanda asked. None of the family had ever really approved of your father. Your mother knew. I think she used it to explain her need to disappear and move far away overnight. Adelia also knew that your father would go looking for you. And did he even try to sue Bank of America to get them to release the whereabouts of your mother, and won? But then he lost in the appeals court, Helen explained. We did not know of your mother's marriage or your name change until a couple of weeks ago, when your picture was published in the paper. When your dad served them that day, your mother made contact with the family in a failed attempt to get her mounting problems to go away. Helen explained, for five years plus, your dad has been a hunted man because of the actions of your mother. I thought we were going to lose him twice. How is my dad really? Amanda asked seriously. He keeps to himself and has lost a lot of weight. The stress he's been under for so long has turned most of his hair completely white. His Facebook page got filled with hate and threats so much that he had to close his account. It forced him to remove his name off the Facebook corporate page too because they went after him on it. They were trying to destroy his business and his life. He's learned not to believe in anyone anymore, so trust very few. He used to be so outgoing. Now he is quiet and reserved. He has no choice. He's free. But he's not. Because there are those who still would like to take their kind of justice out on him, Helen explained. He goes out of town to do any personal shopping for his house. It is getting better gradually for him. Even his side of the family has deserted him. Divorce is normally hard, but what he was hit with was much worse. People down here still believe that he had gotten away with the murder of you three. Does Dad have a girlfriend? Amanda asked. With the reputation your mother gave him. Would you date him? Helen asked. For over five years, he has had to defend himself against a lie where he could not prove the truth. 
Amanda said nothing for a few, then said every time he tried to defend himself, he made it worse because their minds were already made up. He was forced to walk alone. It was made worse with our sudden disappearance because it gave instant credibility to my mother's claims. Adelia and Ronald planned it well. The only one who really had to pay the price was your father. It got so bad for him that I was afraid he would kill himself, Helen said as the tears started to flow. Let's go eat. That was when Amanda realized the price that Holly had paid. She had stood beside her father throughout the last five years. How much had she lost to do that? As they headed towards Helen Carr, Amanda stopped. Thank you, Helen, for what Helen said. For having the guts these last five years to stand by and love my dad. Amanda replied she could no longer hold in the words Amanda said, forced Helen to let go. As the tears flowed, Amanda comforted her. I was sitting in my car at Ruby Tuesdays, watching for them to pull in, trying to figure out what to say to my eldest, who I had not seen in over five years. My emotions were running wild. I had replayed Helen's and Amanda conversation three or four times. I believed what I heard, but I didn't. I saw them pull in, get out, and walk towards the front door. My hands were shaking so bad I could hardly light the cigarette. I was a bundle of nerves. Amanda had grown and blossomed into a beautiful woman. I could see a lot of my own mother's face in her. It saddens me because they had disowned me shortly after my wife and daughters had disappeared. After finishing my smoke, I turned off my car and prepared for one of the shortest but longest walks in my life. The waitress that had served me a couple of weeks back was the acting hostess. She said right away, Amanda's here. I spoke to her. I said, her and her friend towards the back, Are you here to meet? When I said yes. She said, Well, she will have her back to us as we approach the booth they are in. She led me back. Helen saw me right away and smiled. I walked up and then sat down right beside her, grabbing Helen's hand for support. For the first time in over five years, I was looking directly into my daughter's bright blue eyes without saying a word. We both watched each other's tears start to flow. Sometimes you don't know what to say. This was one of those moments. I had asked the hostess to bring us a large flask of their house wine. When it came, the waitress said nothing. After pouring us our first glass, she left us alone. Amanda was in all. Her father had changed so much, he had to have lost forty pounds. Even his face looked longer, thinner, and older. His silvery white hair may have added to it. Many a woman would have to pay major bucks to have that look at his age. She decided one of them had to do something, so she stood up. I responded by doing the same. We met each other at the edge of the table in a big hug. She cried out loud. Dad, I responded. Alma, my old nickname for her. Together, we had broken the ice. Once our emotions had calmed down, we ordered our food. Amanda was surprised how differently I ate. I had always been a meat and potatoes type of guy, so my plate was always filled with starches. Now I ordered a catfish platter with the unlimited salad bar. I refilled my salad plate three times when Helen was refilling hers. It gave Amanda a chance to speak to me privately. Helen loves you, Dad. Probably more than I do, Amanda said. She grilled me like an old army sergeant before she decided I was being honest. She was not going to give me a chance to hurt you again. I have to say that I did. I was old enough to search out for myself, but I didn't. I don't think I will ever forgive myself for that. Amanda. For five years. I have not had a life to offer anyone at any time during that time. If a body had have turned up being identified as one of you, and most likely have ended up in jail, most around here believe that I had somehow murdered the three of you and got away with it. I said I knew. So three years ago, I changed my will, leaving everything to her after the second time, ending up in the hospital with knife wounds from being attacked. I was considering ending it. She's the one that brought me back from that edge. Holly came back to see Amanda bawling. What did you say to her that got this started again? Nothing much. Just that three years ago, while I was in the hospital, having decided it was time to end my life, I had changed my will, leaving everything to you. I told it was your love that brought me back from the edge. I ended up with two females crying after lunch we went and returned the car rental. The ladies then followed me back to my private home at Ryder Lake. 
They loved my private home overlooking the lake with four bedrooms upstairs, a great room, a living room, a kitchen laundry room with open format, and master on the main with a covered breezeway from the garage to the house. I offered to carry Amanda's luggage up the stairs, but she declined. I thought she felt she needed to give us some privacy time. Why didn't you tell me sooner how you felt? Helen said I couldn't. I was trapped by my past. I replied, I didn't know if a body was going to show up or not. Not knowing is far worse than knowing. Adelia and Ronald knew that and used it to their advantage. Now that I'm free from the box they put me, I can offer you a future. Before I couldn't, because I didn't have one. Nora took my hand with a smile on her face. I guess I will be putting my home up for sale, because there's no way I will allow you to sell this. I don't care how old you are, you still feel a bit guilty when your daughter catches you kissing another woman. I know because that's what she did for the next hour. We sat around getting to catch up with what I had missed in my daughter's life. I learned she was working in the business world in a go-nowhere situation and working online towards her master's in business administration. She wasn't dating. Seriously, why don't you come and work for us? I said, we can afford it, and we do need a fresh set of eyes. You can start in a junior position and work your way up. After all, we collectively have cause to have happened to you. Are you serious? Amanda asked. Yes, we are, Amanda. Helen responded with the biggest smile I had ever seen. We can start you with an annual salary of 45000 a year. Wow. I guess I will have to look for a place to live, Amanda said. Don't be in such a rush. We have lots of room here, I said. But I will expect you to do chores just like before, Amanda replied as the tears started flowing. Dad, why you are and always have been a big part of my life. I replied, I'll fly out tomorrow to pack if I can work out a flight, depending on how long it takes. I should be here sometime Wednesday in my car. Amanda said, let's add both your phone numbers to my contact list. We had just finished doing that when Amanda got a text message from Miranda. Amanda showed it to me. Finally got my cell phone back. The FBI is holding me until they get the DNA report to prove that Ronald Peterson is or is not my biological father. I had a writing expert show me how they proved the adoption agreement was falsely created. Can't call, but can receive and send a text because it's a secure center. Amanda wrote back with our real dad now flying back to New York tomorrow to pack clothes. I'm moving back home and joining his firm. His cell phone number is under her. Miranda texted back, Bring my two and my laptop. The lawyers can have the rest of the stuff. Amanda texted back to see if you can get a copy of the U.S. Today newspaper for today. You need to read the article about us in. It explains a lot of things that I didn't know. Call me as soon as you're able so I can tell you a lot of things that I have learned. Helen saw me go outside to the patio and followed me. How are you feeling? She asked. Emotionally overwhelmed, I responded as I took her into my arms. How about I take Amanda with me and go back to my place so I can get some of my clothes? Helen said that will give you some time to deal with your emotional thoughts. I sent to her cell phone the program for the electronic lock on the gate so she could open it, and gave her the house keys to copy, suggesting that we may need four of them. They were gone for about two hours. I spent most of the time crying. I figured the pains and hurt I had been carrying for such a long was coming out. I was right the way I was behaving. It was like a dam had broken. When they returned, I was smiling. So were they. I was on the patio firing up the grill, getting ready to throw some thawed steaks on. I had already made a toss salad and was baking some potatoes. I watched their chatter as they each carried a handful in. After four trips, they had brought a lot of stuff. It was now laying on the master bed over the very late dinner. I learned that Amanda was flying out at eight Sunday morning. Helen and I would be moving more of her stuff over tomorrow. It pleased me to see the girls overeat. We were all drinking a coffee afterward when my cell phone went off. The only one outside of who was present with me that had this number was the FBI. I answered it by saying, Hello, Mr. Masters, it's Doug Drysdale. Just to update you, the DNA test confirms you are Miranda's father. We got it confirmed about two hours ago. We told her she wants to come home, so we have her landing in Cape at 730 Monday morning. That's great. Helen and I will be there to meet her. I responded perfect. 
We knew that Amanda had headed in your direction last night. Let her know that her sister did see a copy of that article online. Doug said you might like to know when we broke the news to Ronald Peterson. He was devastated. It seems that Adelia had convinced him that Miranda was his. Doesn't make a difference. He's still looking at a lot of time. A quick question when the dust settles. What are my daughter's legal name? I asked. Their legal name is Masters. We got a court ruling on that Friday morning. A copy of the federal court ruling will allow you to get their identification changed. It will arrive at your office on Monday. With that, he ended the call. I couldn't help it. The tears started flowing. I got choked up. I couldn't speak. Both Helen and Amanda got concerned. Thankfully, I quickly regained my composure. Miranda will be arriving at the airport at 730 Monday morning. DNA tests confirm she's mine, I said. When they revealed that fact to Ronald Peterson, he was devastated. Adelia had him convinced she was his. I knew it, said Helen. Did my cousin Adelia ever tell anyone the truth? Amanda, I got some bad news. You have to change your last name back to Masters because the federal court ruled your adoption invalid. My daughter ran into my arms crying. Peterson never felt right. We saw Amanda off as she headed back to New York to bring back in her car what she wanted. Then we headed over to meet Helen's two brothers and their wives in Jackson. They were going to help move what furniture she wanted out of her house. Since I only had two of the bedrooms furnished, we had lots of room to move her stuff into. The whole story was out in print, in the Sunday edition of the Southeast Missouri newspaper. We met them at Hickory House for breakfast. All of them noticed the glow of happiness on Helen's face. Her sister-in-laws bought out the point that in six months with Helen's cooking, I would have some meat on my bones. The owner of the restaurant, a longtime friend, said, Congrats, John. This meal is on us. We got it all done in one long day. I think Helen's sisters-in-law were envious of her new home. Helen and I offered to take them and their families out to dinner, but they all declined, but suggested they would all be in when we hosted our first housewarming party with all of our family as home. We were there at the airport at 7.15 in the morning because some days the connector flight arrived early. Helen had let those who needed to know that neither one of us would be in today. The response was, We figured that when we read the Sunday paper, I watched Miranda walk down the stairs off of the small plane, heading in towards me, wearing a pair of blue jeans and a tank top. I found it difficult to see how much she had changed. The last time I had seen her, she was a teeny bopper in pigtails. Coming towards me was a stunning young lady. The moment she saw me, she started running towards me. The sliding doors opened to allow her to run in. She cried out loudly as she literally jumped into my arms. Daddy! For both of us, our emotions let go. We were all being captured by cameras. We didn't care. I heard Helen tell the CAFO's 12-station reporter, That's John Masters, and the youngest of two daughters that half the town thought he had killed. Turns out they've been kidnapped over five years ago. The FBI is holding their mother and her lover in jail for it right now. This is the first time they have seen each other in over five years. We had broken up and turned towards the reporter. I am Miranda Masters. That's my father, John Masters, five years ago. With my mother's family's help, we were kidnapped. They had spread rumors that our father had sexually controlled us. That is not true. My mother's extended family may be into doing things like that, but my dad did not, and would not. Anyone planning to go after him in the future is going after my sister and me. We are family, and we stand together. My mother told us when she was divorcing my father that he was just a man getting what he deserved. None of us deserved what she did to me. He is not just my father, but is also the most honest person I have ever known. I introduced Miranda to Helen. Miranda hugged her and said, Amanda and I had a long talk yesterday about everything we had learned. It turned out our mother had lied and misled Ronald just as much as she did. Our dad and her need to be the center of attention. She ended up almost destroying five lives. We know dad, and you were planning to get married. So as far as Amanda and I are concerned, we want to forget the Helen part. Okay, Mom. Helen teared up and said, You could not have said it better, Miranda. I'll agree if you promise to be one of my bridesmaids. Let's go get some breakfast. Then we'll get you some clothing at Macy's, I suggested. Can we go to Denny's? 
Miranda asked if they were still open. Yes, but Huddle House is the closest thing to it for breakfast. Food. I replied, if that's okay. It was, and I was surprised how much my youngest could eat. I thought the way she eats, it might be cheaper to get her room and board somewhere. I was still finding it hard to believe I had a life again. My two daughters were back in my life in a way I would never have dreamed possible. I no longer slept in a house. It was now home. Well, we were shopping at Macy's. I got deliberately lost and drifted away. There's just something unmanly about watching women discuss bra sizes, underwear, and personal stuff. By the time they realized I was missing, I was almost back. Helen asked where I slipped off to, and I said the washroom. I had to sit and watch as Miranda tried things on. For some reason, she wanted my approval. Heck, as far as I was concerned, I thought she'd look good in anything. Dollar three hundred later, we left carrying two bags. When we got back to the house, Helen took and showed her the now furnished four bedrooms upstairs. Helen was tickled pink when Miranda picked the room that had her master bedroom furniture in it. We were sitting out on the patio, enjoying the space before the heat of the day got too hot. The ladies were having an iced tea. I was having a cold, but I got up and walked over to Helen, taking the ring box out of my pocket. I got down on one knee, catching her off guard. Since I haven't officially asked you, I said, as I opened the box holding the three ring set, will you marry me as soon as my divorce is final? Of course, she said yes. Miranda had captured it all and sent it to Amanda with a text. Yes, it fits. I had found out her ring size from her brother. About half an hour later, Helen got an unexpected call. Both Miranda and I looked at her in concern because she had unexpectedly teared up. I didn't understand until she handed me her cell phone. As soon as the person said, Congrats, Dad, I understood it was my eldest daughter. You on the road yet? I asked. I left it for yesterday. I've been driving basically non-stop since then, Amanda explained. There is a lot less traffic when you're driving at night, and not as many cops on the highway. My car cruises well at just over 100. Let my sister know I got her stuff. I said I would, and asked how much farther she had to go. She replied, What time is it? There? I said, About 2 p.m. Why? She said, I need you direct me. I just pulled off onto the off-ramp at Cape. I told her I would text her the directions I did. I didn't know whether to be proud or upset, because it appeared that she had driven 24 hours straight. The girls heard the car coming up the driveway and were at the door waiting for her before she got out of her car. Amanda looked tired, but otherwise was fine. Then it hit me hard. I was seeing my three girls together. First thing Amanda had to do was see Helen's engagement ring. That was when the house phone rang. I ran to answer it. John, we have been swamped today, Chris said. Some of the clients we lost because of the rumors are coming back. And we got a lot of new ones calling to set up appointments and a lot of them are out of state. If this keeps up, we're going to have to hire a lot more staff working on that as we speak. My daughter Amanda will be starting as a junior next week. I said she's green, but is working towards her master's in business administration. Can I have her on my team? Chris asked. It will be long hours, but she will learn the ropes the hard way. I said okay. Chris Aker was a go-getter. I had hired him right after he graduated at the head of his class. Like us all, he had learned the hard way, and it had cost us. But with time, he had more than made up for it. It did not take long for him to learn that what was taught his business theory had no practical use in the real world. He knew, and was not afraid to admit it. Everyone working under him was learning the same way. It was his approach. If you saw someone making a mistake, you stopped them to teach them as to why their thinking or approach was wrong. The only question that was considered wrong in his eyes was the one you didn't ask Chris. Helen and I will be taking the rest of the week off. We still got a lot of things to straighten out. I said with our engagement and the girls coming home, we got some legal messes to sort out with them, besides enrolling Miranda in school. Engaged? Wow. That reminds me. We got a courier letter from the FB. A can you swing down and pick it up at five? Chris said. Heck yes. Thanks for reminding me. I had let it slip my mind, I said, just before saying goodbye. At 430, the four of us were heading into town. 
we had decided to celebrate our first official meal as a family at Red Lobster, a place my daughters picked. I pulled up in front of our office, and I asked Amanda if she wanted to see where she was going to work. She said yes, so we all went in. As we walked in, the receptionist stood up and led us to the biggest conference room. Inside were a large cake and a huge banner that said, Congratulations. Amanda met her new boss. Everybody met my new family. It was noticed that my daughters were already calling Helen mom. We finally made the restaurant about 630. It was during their annual All the Shrimp You Can Eat deal. My daughters quit counting after 140 and couldn't believe I now ate raw lemons like most people eat oranges. My daughters and I read the court ruling together. He first noted that the document used was one that could easily be found on LegalZoom.com, which required no lawyer to make it up. The second point was that the writing experts said that the signature of John Allen Masters had been traced over to copy it. Doing this had caused major breaks in the natural flow of the ink during tracing, when comparing each of his signatures on the document. The breaks were not in constants in each signature to establish the pattern of behavior one develops over time with their signature. The third point was that the way I signed my name, I had never used my full middle name. The fourth dead giveaway was that the recorded date of my signature, according to the witnesses of it, was after they had left the state of Missouri. The second page was the court ruling that Amanda and Miranda Peterson were, and had never been their legal names. Therefore, in the eyes of the court, they had always been Amanda Masters and Miranda Masters, and that all legal representatives of their identification should be altered to reflect that fact. We spent the week cleaning up the legal problems. First was the Social Security Office, then the State Attorney's Office, to have their birth certificates restored to their original names, then to the Motor Vehicle Department to get new driver's licenses in their original name. For me personally, I took great satisfaction in sitting across from the very same school principal to register Miranda in grade 11, who had told where to go and how to do it five years ago. The last thing I did on Thursday was to pick them up their new cell phones. On Friday, I had Amanda and Miranda follow Helen and me to the Ford Groves dealership in Jackson. She had given me permission to trade in her car along with Helen's. The ladies each took home a brand new lease to own through my company a 2019 Ford Escape. Once home, I wrote Amanda a check for the trade-in value. We were allowed against our huge down payment. My divorce lawyer called for the first time in five years. My daughters and I were to be in court for a hearing set up for 1 p.m. on Monday. I asked Helen if she wanted to go with us. She said, darn right. We were all seated before Judge Donald McDonald watching Adelia Lynn Peterson as she took her seat in the huge monitor before us without her bells and whistles. She didn't look like much. The color orange really did not suit her. The judge asked her lawyer if he had anything to say on the charge of contempt. He said that according to her, she had not understood that fact that she had to be in court that day. The judge asked her lawyer, did you reminded her numerous times as you worked out the settlement? He answered yes. Are you that incompetent in your field to believe that the defendant might be telling the truth? The lawyer responded, no. How does your client wish to plea? No contest, your honor. I sentence her to five years to be served after any federal time, the judge said in coldness. Your honor, her lawyer said. Isn't that a bit extreme? Judge MacDonald replied, not in my eyes, but she has the right to appeal. As for the divorce... It is granted in favor of Mr. Masters, all assets remaining from their marriage. She forfeited any rights she had to them the day she left the state with her minor daughters. He turned to my lawyer and said, Drop the divorce degree and put in a waiver for the required number of days. I think your client has waited long enough, Your Honor. My lawyer said my client does have one final request that he like you to grant. What is that? Donald said while looking at me with questioning eyes. He's recently got engaged to Miss Helen Beard, and he was wondering if you would handle the civil ceremony when they got married. My lawyer said Helen and the girls almost jumped out of their seats. I had a big smile on my face. My lawyer and I had thought it might play out like this. If it did, he was to use the funds I had to put in his trust 
to pay Ford Groves for the lease of the cars and have the ownership transferred into Helen and the kids' individual names and write me a check for what was left. I would be honored to, and congratulations to both of them. It's long overdue, the judge said with a huge smile. We could all still see Adelia face on the monitor. Her face glowed in the whiteness of pure shock. I felt that she believed she would get off the contempt charge with thirty days at most. Not this. It had to be smarting like heck for her to learn in court. I was marrying her younger cousin. The judge brought down his mallet and said, The court is adjourned. As we stood up to leave, the judge walked over to me and shook my hand. I introduced him to my future wife and my daughters with the formal respect I thought he deserved. He told them all, I'm not on the bench right now, so it's just on. Before we departed, he said, We got to go fly fishing soon, John, before it gets too darn hot. No man, I believe, has ever seen three more girls excited than the three girls in my life were. They all started talking up a storm, having been used to the sounds of silence for so long. I was wishing for a good set of earplugs. That's when I caught a glimpse of a couple quietly leaving the court. It hit me hard. They were the last persons I expected to see. It was my mom and dad, as my dad said when he ended our relationship and disowned me. Forgiveness is easy. Forgetting is not. I was learning the hard way, how true the fact was. Nothing excites girls more than anything than being invited into the planning of a wedding. That is what filled our home as we got back into a normal routine. Helen put her house up for sale. Amanda was fitting in with my staff really well. It had been commented that she had a sharp, keen mind. Miranda, during the first week, had rediscovered some of the friends she had known before and was reconnecting. Masters Consulting was being swamped as we landed two new corporations that month that needed completely restructured if they were to survive, along with a major cash inflow. Amanda surprised the heck out of us all when she pointed out things that we had completely overlooked that were costing our customer millions in prospective sales. It took her three weeks to turn that part around. The increase in sales as a result surprised everyone. Helen and I were lying in bed, just cuddling one night. She was adjusting to becoming a mom, just like I was at being a dad again. You know, dear, my biological clock is ticking. How long do you think we should wait before trying for one or two of our own? Helen asked, while looking at me with her dreamy buttercup eyes. I have to admit, I had never given that a thought, but I knew after all she had gone through with me. I had no right to refuse. Let me answer your question this way. As long as you're not showing for our wedding pictures... I will leave that up to you. I said, I don't think I have to explain why neither one of us got much sleep that night. It was on Mother's Day that we finally said our vows. Amanda was the maid of honor. Miranda and another niece. Maids in waiting. Chris Acker was my best man. And two of my nephews ushers. It was a small affair held at the back of our house, with the lake in the background. Helen's brothers had been in charge of getting the yard ready. The judge married us while standing beneath Ann Arbor of spring flowers. All of us men were dressed in blue jeans, wearing cowboy hats and matching boots. Of course, the ladies went all out. Helen wore a traditional white wedding gown. Her bridesmaids wore yellow dresses. Her extended family went all out, as the barbecue spread was a delight. That night, our patio turned into a huge dance floor with live music. Life went on. Adelia and Ronald's criminal trial had begun. Ronald had filed for divorce. My civil lawyer was in discussion with their lawyers and Bank of America's legal team hired for this case. Our first Father's Day as a new family was approaching. I knew my wife and daughters were planning something, but I had no clue as to what. On Father's Day, Helen and I were up on the lake in our canoe, fishing at the crack of dawn. The fish were really biting. It seemed that as soon as the flies hit the water, they were hitting in less than an hour. We had our limit just before we started to head back to shore. Helen handed me a card she had hidden on her body. I opened it. It said, Happy Father's Day, Daddy. We're pregnant, and it's a boy. I jumped in excitement and flipped the canoe. We lost everything. The fish, the fishing poles, and our tackle box. We ended up going back to shore, and our canoe completely soaked. When the girls found out about how I found out, they thought it was a hoot.
They had already been told about Helen's good news. It takes time for things to mellow, but that is not always true. For me, it took watching the birth of my son. He came into the world screaming, weighing seven pounds. It had shocked my mother when I called, asking her to come to the hospital maternity ward as soon as possible. When my mother arrived, I rushed her into Helen's room, where she was holding our son. His name is Colin. Richard. I said my mother lost it. That had been her grandfather's name. As for my father and I, we still don't speak. He would have to come to me. And as of the time of writing this, he hasn't. But each morning is another day, and life goes on.